This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for having me. I always, I'm always very nervous when I speak at Cornell. This is, I think it's called imposter syndrome. This is when the others find out that you are not worth it. <laughs> and, and, um, or you feel at least this is that way. So I hope I can show you something. I actually want to take a little bit of a risky talk. Some of you may have seen at least parts of the first part that I'm talking about today. Um, but I want you to take part in a process that I went through while thinking about plant responses to any kinds of environmental stresses. And I emphasize plant responses here, not right away start with plant resistance, which is what we are actually studying in my lab. So induced responses that are functioning as resistance um, eventually against insect herbivores. Um, but I would rather take that much more neutral step in viewing all plant responses as neutral to begin with. And you will see why I'm sort of emphasizing that in the beginning already. And um, before I actually start, I want to um, show you the people that are involved in most of what we are doing, what, we are, what I'm talking about today. And, and these are um, two postdocs in my lab who both left this summer. It's really bad, Stuart Campbell and Reiko Litschke. Um, oh no, that's the third poster who left, who's also involved in the work that I'm showing today, Akana Suki. And so there are some places open now in the lab. And then there are the, um, a grad student, Kim Morell, and an undergrad student, Amy Erickson, with who I will show um, data today. Um, and in fact, the undergrad students here in the picture, so there's two of them only, and one was back here in the building. They all <laughs> just <laughs> last year wrote every, each one a paper on their honors thesis that was um, are now in review, so it was really impressive to have this group of undergrad students in the lab. <clears throat> so when I talk about induced plant responses, then I'm talking about metabolic changes of the plant and, and the, in the most basic sense you can envision. So, the, so we not only talk about um, changes in secondary metabolite production, but also Bob Turgeon, unfortunately, is not here. He wrote me an email this morning that he wanted to come, but he knows very well that also primary metabolism is changing dramatically in response to any kinds of environmental stresses, more or less depending on the plant species, more or less depending on plant genotype. And we'll see some of that, that later. So what happens when an insect is actually feeding very strongly depends on the environmental condition in which the plant is growing, on the plant species that you're looking at, and on the insect herbivore, and this is probably the most important, or if you want the attacker in general, right? And I'm saying insect herbivore because it can be as fine-tuned as in this particular case. This is um, a chrysomelid beetle or larvae of a chrysomelid beetle called Triraptor virgato is feeding on goldenrods who are now nicely flowering outside. Um, and they feed on, on these goldenrods and goldenrods you can based on, in goldenrods you can based on the secondary metabolite production tell two different chrysomelid beetle species apart on the plant. And it's very consistent across different genotypes. So that means even though there may be large genotypic differences in the resistance of those plants to the different um, species, the response that the plants have after they are attacked by these herbivores go all in the same direction. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I tell you that in the beginning, I'll come back to that um, a little bit later. So now people have speculated about induced or the function of induced responses a lot. And as I told you, induced resistance was the one thing that came up and everybody's talking about. Plants become more resistant after they are attacked and change their metabolism. And this is true in many cases, but by far not in all cases. So we also have cases of induced susceptibility. So the metabolism changes to the benefit of the herbivore attacking the plant. Um, and there may be no changes at all, which, you know, people who work here on pathogens and herbivores may be familiar with. There's a lot of experiments that seem not to work, right? But they are simply nothing happens to the plant, seemingly nothing happens. Um, one thing that induced responses of plants also mediate is something, and I also want to kind of take um, a more neutral stem to that, is called indirect resistance traits. Um, in this particular case, it's the... Um, the metabolic change in the plants provides some sort of information that allow 
another organism, so for example, an organism of the third trophic level, a predator, to use that information and find that their prey, in this case it's a, um, a mirrored bug, um, that is the herbivore in this case, and, and kill that. So in this particular example, it's about a tobacco plant um, that I was working on with Ian Baldwin already at Max Planck, and then we continued here a little bit. Um, in this case, the damage by the herbivores is inducing a very specific volatile emission. I mean, species, so herbivore species specific volatile emission. Those volatiles can be detected by those predaceous bugs. They come in, kill the herbivore, and save the plant. And in this particular case, um, it's actually very efficient. So um, they can reduce or the plant's ability, so we did that with um, genetically modified plants that were not able to emit volatiles um, or not able to respond to damage per se, actually both, both of these things we tried. But in all of those cases, a plant that is not responding to the damage and therefore is not providing information to the environment, um, and in this particular case is not emitting volatiles, has a 90% higher damage rate than a plant that can do that. Right? So it's a traumatic effect of traumatic indirect effect through the third trophic level interactions. So people came up with um, a lot of theories of why plants change their metabolic phenotype in response to damage. Right? So why do you have this kind of stress response? And in the beginning, in fact, it was totally focused on induced resistance. Right? Because people found that if you put an insect herbivore on a plant that has been damaged already, they usually perform worse on these plants in comparison to a plant that was not damaged before, right? And so the first ones were, for example, Rhodes here, who wrote about an evolutionary hypothesis for why plants do that, and he came up with the idea, well, it's simply a part of what we call the optimal defense theory. So optimal defense theory says that plants should allocate their resources so that the effect, the benefit they gain from investing into defense does not compromise their reproductive success, right? And so what that means is when an insect, uh, when a plant is responding to an insect or a pathogen or whatever is changing its phenotype, it is based on this hypothesis, investing, in, investing in the, into costly defenses only when it's needed in the case of an actual herbivore attack, right? And otherwise, if there's no herbivore or no pathogen, they wouldn't invest into those defenses. This is optimal defense theory. And induced resistance was seen in the early days as a cost-saving strategy that is functioning on the plant phenotype, so within a lifetime of a plant, right? So the plant can allocate resources as needed. You can read about that in, in the Carbon Baldwin book, and also there's a nice review in the Quarterly Review of Biology by Nancy Stem very recently that sort of summarizes all the defense hypotheses. So this is overall um, induce, inducible resistance as a cost-saving strategy. And there were two very nice papers, one that derived actually from work that Ian Baldwin still did as, an, as a graduate student here at Cornell and one that now our own Anurag Agrawal did, and they published it in the same year, both in, one in science, one in nature, um, where they compared um, plants that are constitutively investing into those resources. So they treated plants so that it would always be induced compared to plants that were never induced, compared to plants that only had induced resistance when needed. And they found that there's a high cost when you um, have the plant constitutively induced, right? This was great. This drove an entire field, but there is a problem with that, right? So you're comparing two things, two metabolic states of the plant that involve both, as I mentioned in the beginning, primary and secondary metabolism. It is not that metabolic change is not, in fact, only the upregulation of costly defense metabolites. There's a lot of compounds that are downregulated in response to damage. For those of you who, who do some um, HPLC or GCMS, whatever, there are in many cases almost as many compounds downregulated as upregulated, right? So you cannot make that cost argument at all cases. And secondly, it's not that clear how costly these compounds really are. And people have tried to analyze that and to calculate it through and whatever, but it seems to be all within the 
tolerance range that a plant has available and resources and to allocate into some defenses, right? So plants, for plants, it's not that costly to produce these compounds, presumably, right? And so there were other hypotheses that people came up with then. So the other one was the distribution of damage within the plant. So when you have a modular plant, most plants are actually modular, <laughs> um, and you have one branch here and one branch here, if there's damage on this branch, is inducing resistance, forces the herbivore to move over. The idea behind that is if you have one branch and all leaves of that branch are stripped down, the seed production on this branch will be much lower than if you had that same amount of damage distributed across the entire plant. Because then the damage on each branch may be within the tolerance range that the plant has to compensate for the amount of damage that it receives. That was a very, very good one, but there's only very few studies done on that. Um, and the, this one actually, that, that was the original one, was a model study, so it's a, just a mathematical model. And this one um, is the only one that actually thoroughly tests it. <clears throat> then the third one I already talked about, um, the attraction of predators and parasitoids to the plant requires a metabolic change because otherwise there's no information, right? So if the, the herbivores are presumably under selection to be um, stealth feeders, so not being seen by anyone, by any predator, by any parasitoid. So you, you will see a lot of adaptations in insect herbivores if they are not themselves very toxic, right? In which case they're aposematic. They will smell exactly like the plant or they will look exactly like the plant or they will be underneath the leaf or, you know, these kinds of things. They will be not seen. And therefore, there's a benefit from the plant's perspective to attract predators in through a larger signal, potentially, and this could be induced with a volatile emission. But that only works if the metabolism of the plant changes with herbivory, because otherwise there's no information, right, in that. So if a plant, for example, would constitutively emit volatiles, the predators would soon figure out there is no prey associated with that particular cue that's coming off the plant. And then there is one almost forgotten so-called moving target hypothesis that was brought up by um, Rick Carbon and his then um, postdoc. And um, this comes from military, right? Military strategy kind of thing. So if you move around a lot, you are a much worse target than if you are standing in place, right? And the military people use that. And his argument was, this is exactly what plants do. So there's not a per se fitness benefit of producing the compounds only when needed, it's simply the metabolic change that is adaptive. So it's not the increased production of defensive metabolites or resistance mediating metabolites, it is simply the metabolic change. So the plant becomes something different for an insect. And it makes sense to a certain extent because all insects, but in particular those that feed on larval stages on plants have this initial feeding bouts. Um, so they have their first feeding is very little, and then they wait for a relatively long period of time before they continue to feed. And this is when they're ready their detoxification enzymes and stuff like that. They optimize their digestion to that exact plant genotype, right? And um, if the plant is in that time frame changing its metabolism, it becomes something different. So it becomes that moving target that the insects have a hard, hard time to follow, in which case the simple change in metabolism over time is adaptive from the plant's perspective because it will reduce the fitness of the herbivore on the plant. Now we wanted to study all of this and I kind of, as I mentioned, um, will give you some information that some of you may have seen already from our work on wild tomatoes in Peru. Um, because we wanted to study these kinds of effects on wild species and that started an entirely new kind of thinking and I wanted to have you be part in that kind of thinking. So we went to Peru, this is how it looks like. Um, and most of the tomatoes, so <clears throat> what is it? 12 of the 14 so far described tomato species grow on the Pacific slope of the Andes. And this is in general habitat that looks like this. So it's a relatively dry habitat. All the wild tomatoes um, in comparison to other plant species are extremely drought resistant. Um, they are usually the plants that are green and flowering when everything else is yellow, like in this picture. Um, and they continuously flower throughout the entire year and are, have green leaves throughout the entire year. Um, the plant species that I want to focus on 
in this talk is one that is one of the most widely distributed wild tomato species called Solanum peruvianum. Um, and just to mention, there's you know, some studies that we want to initiate on this one. This plant grows in the valley where we are working um, from 500 meters above sea level up to 3,800 meters above sea level, continuous population. Of course, everything changes along that gradient, right? Um, and we are worried that actually the plant species may change too, but this is not yet figured out. Um, but this plant is attacked by a large number, or relatively large, and for us, surprisingly large diversity of insect herbivores. And originally, the idea was to study in very detail, and this was physiological detail, um, the plant's specific responses to those different herbivores. And it turned out, interestingly, that the wild tomatoes that we study are not specific at all. So in other words, it doesn't quite matter which herbivore is feeding on the plant. The plant will generally do the same thing to an extent in this case that we now wonder whether or not this is adaptive in this particular case for a particular reason. So we don't know that. This is one, one future study that we want to do. The other things that we had figured out, we see a, a couple of induced metabolic changes that include secondary metabolite production, um, antidigestive protein production, like proteinase inhibitors and stuff like that. Um, and we see an induced um, resistance to herbivores um, normally, not to all. What's important, though, for my talk is that the diversity of herbivores feeding on the plant is only matched by the, on the leaves, is only matched by the diversity of organisms that feed on the flowers. Um, and so we have a also surprisingly high diversity of bees feeding on those plants. And the special thing is here, um, you may know that um, actually all Solanum flowers have these anthocones where um, po the pollen sacs actually open to the inside. And so the bees or the pollinators have to be specialized to get any pollen out of those plants. What they do, they hook onto the plant, vibrate their wings, and it comes out. Um, so there's this vibratile or bus pollination, um, and it needs some behavioral specialization on the side of the bees. That's why it's surprising that we had such a high diversity of bees doing that. And we, in fact, established in this study um, the first encounter of elicted bees, which are very small bees, um, to bus pollinate flowers. So they were not known to bus at all, the entire group of elicteds, and, and they do it here. Now, the thing was that when we started the work with the wild tomatoes, um, what we figured out very quickly was we have absolutely no idea about the ecology of wild tomatoes. So nothing was known other than where the plants grow. And even that was um, old data, Charlie Rick's data pretty much from his collections in, um, in Peru. And a lot of those sites that he cited on, on uh, that are still cited on the, on the website um, are now paved over so you can't find the plants there anymore. So we had, it took us quite a while to actually find the plants. But then there was, in the literature, was nothing known about the ecology, non, not, nothing about the herbivores that are naturally associated with those plants, nothing about the pollinators. And so we had to do some very general ecological surveys. And among them was one survey um, where we compared the proportion of leaves damage as a very crude measure of damage. So this could be, even in that category here, you could have only 10% leaf tissue removal but every single leaf received a little hole, right? So every damage on a leaf was counted as a yes on that leaf. And so you get a percentage of leaves damaged as a crude measure of damage. And on the other hand, I just told you about the pollination marks. We used a proportion of flowers with pollination marks as a measure for pollinator traction, right? And so those pollination marks are these brown marks, which are a result of a polyphenol oxidase reaction, when the bees hold onto, when they bus pollinate, right? They have these claws and they hook onto those anthocones and then very tightly hold on and then vibrate their wings so that this entire thing is vibrating and the pollen shoots out on the bottom. And then they collect the pollen from their belly, right? And this actually, this mark is species specific. If you, if you train your eye, you actually know which bee species has done that. And it occurs within five minutes after a pollination event happened, right? And it is, in fact, a pollination event. We don't know how successful it is. It may still be different between the different bee species. But it's definitely a pollination event because 
It's normally the bee's belly that's, a, that's a touching um, the stigma down here, and then um, pollen is deposited. So this was our measure. And we saw this very interesting pattern. So the more damage you have on the plant from herbivores on leaves, right, the fewer flowers in those inflorescences have pollination marks, suggesting that there is lower attraction of pollinators, right? But this is just a correlation, so those two things may not be causally linked, and that's why we started a small study that generated everything I'm telling you today. Um, so we did an experiment where we manipulated herbivory. So we had plants that were not damaged and then had a set of damaged and undamaged plants. In this particular case, they were damaged by flea beetles simply because they're easier to collect and to control on the plants. Um, and when you have a certain number of beetles feeding on the plant, and this is actually less than 10% leaf tissue removed, I emphasize that if it becomes important later, you get a significant reduction, up to 25% reduction in this particular case, in the proportion of flowers um, with pollination marks. So fewer pollinators are coming to the flowers when they're damaged. You can simulate that when you apply methyl jasmonate. So methyl jasmonate is a methyl ester of jasmonic acid, which is a phytohormone that has been shown to be crucial um, for the endogenous signaling associated with mechanical damage. So if you silence, for example, we have done that in other plant species, if you silence jasmonic acid production in a plant, inducible jasmonic acid production, plants are not able to see a herbivore feeding. There will be no induced change in response to that damage. And this is herbivore feeding. So you will still see a, a response to a pathogen though, right? It's important. Um, so if you apply just simply methyl jasmonate, meaning without any damage, this is just making the plant <laughs> believe that I don't like, I'd like to say that. So you, you simulate damage by just providing the endogenous signal that signals damage in the plant, right? Without any damage available, and you get the same, a similar reduction in pollinator attraction, and that translates in a traumatic reduction in seed set. And as I said, a 25% reduction in seed set. So it has a fitness effect. And this is actually, in fact, the largest fitness effect we have ever seen coming from an herbivore and in this particular case, is simply mediated through the attraction or non-attraction of a pollinator. Now you could still argue, well, maybe this reduction is simply due to the fact that leaf tissue is removed and therefore there are less resources available to put into seeds, right? So it's maybe not, has nothing to do with pollinator attraction. Maybe in the plants would still, even though we have fewer pollinators coming, they would still produce the same number of seeds. So it's not necessarily the pollinators that cause this reduction in seed set. It could be simply um, the amount of damage. But as I told you in the experiment, we used less than 10% damage actually overall. But we wanted to make sure that this is true. So what we did, we only used methyl jasmonate and then had open and hand pollination. So with methyl jasmonate, we already exclude any damage but yet methyl jasmonate was, or jasmonic acid per se, was first identified as a growth inhibitor, right? So we have to see that. So they may, just the signaling itself may reduce um, seed production. And here when you have open pollination, we get the same picture as we had before, right? And this is now the number of, of um, fruit, uh, seeds per fruit produced. But if you hand pollinate them and cover them up, then you get even a slightly higher production when you have jasmonate here. So that shows that it's not due to um, limited resource availability of the herbivore damage, it's due to limitation by pollinators. And because that, uh, called that herbivore induced pollinator limitation, which is what that is. <clears throat> now, we wanted to figure out why that is, and now mechanistically why, why do the bees actually avoid? And so we looked for signals, of course there's two obvious ones. One is there may be an optical hue that's changing. If you look at the flowers on the UV, um, tomato flowers, usually the, the petals, well, I should I'm supposed to do it here, but here's actually the picture is not so, so clear. The petals are actually reflecting UV while the anthocone is strongly absorbing UV. So under UV, this is all shiny light and this is black dark, even though it's all yellow to us, right? So there could have been a change in that in that visual cue in response to damage, especially when I tell you metabolism changes dramatically, but it could be also the volatiles coming out of this, 
right? And this is how we trap volatiles in the field. So we develop this very low cost system on this end, at least on the trapping side is low cost. And when you run it on a GC, it becomes more costly um, because we have far more samples to run, right? So this, this method allows you to do up to 16 samples per pump. So the more pumps we can carry, the more car batteries we can carry into the field, the more samples we can take. And we are now, we have some experiments that go up to 120 samples per experiment. And what we do is we pull ambient air through that chamber over the plant, and in this particular case, over the inflorescence, and onto um, absorbent tubes. And they could be, in this particular case, it's charcoal that's absorbing the organic compounds, and then you elute them down with dichlomethane or hexane and analyze them in a GCMS. Um, this is how that looks like in the field. This is Ryko, my long-term postdoc in the lab. And it's pretty dangerous in some cases because the plants tend to grow on these landslides. Um, yeah, it could be dangerous. Never mind. So what do we find? Blur your eyes and concentrate first on the first two. So these are plants that were not damaged. This is just a normal volatile emission from leaves not from flowers, this is from leaves. And this is a plant damaged by Manduka caterpillars. So this is the tobacco hornworm actually. It used to be called, until 1964, this was the tomato hornworm. And then another species became the tomato hornworm and this became the tobacco hornworm. Um, I just highlight here, there's a number of monoterpenes and a number of sesquiterpenes that are dramatically upregulated, right? If you just look here, dramatically up in response to damage. And this is what you see normally in tomatoes. Tomatoes very, smell very different when you damage them with an herbivore. Now the interesting part was that, and now we go down here, if you compare um, leaf emission with flower emission, there are a number of compounds that are only produced in the leaves. You may say it is not a surprise. It was a surprise to me because if I put my nose on a tomato flower, I don't smell a difference between the flower and the leaves. And it's probably because the, the leaves already smell so terpenoid that um, it blocks up everything that we can taste. But, but this is actually, so there are a number of compounds that are only produced in the flowers. But the biggest surprise was that there are a number of compounds that are only produced in the flowers and only in response to herbivore damage on the leaves. So you get a specific metabolic change in the floral metabolism in response to the herbivore damage, which provides a potential signal for the bees to differentiate at least between damaged and uh, flowers on damaged and undamaged plants. And so for that we had to, and I have to speed up a little bit, um, we had to come up with an experiment and I very briefly explain the experiment and very quickly go into the result because I want you to see the other more evolutionary study. Um, what we could take advantage of is that these tomato plants are huge. So they often have three meters in diameter in the field with a lot of branches, and those branches are independent, meaning that if you damage one branch, you can measure induced and systemic induced resistance along that entire branch, but it will not affect, at least not directly, affect a neighboring branch. So you could have a control branch and a damaged branch on the same plant as the ideal kind of comparison, so you have a paired comparison then. But what you can also do is, you can bring the inflorescences of both together. So that you, what you can create is a chimeric inflorescence that has either the order of a damaged plant or the order of an undamaged plant or the combination of the two. And then if you want to test whether or not a visual cue is involved as well, you can cover up one part of it. So in this particular case, what that was, was in the back was the inflorescence on a damaged branch and outside is the visual cue of an undamaged branch. So the bees would be exposed to an undamaged flower bouquet, but it smells like a damaged, right? And then you need a lot of controls for that. And we had to do this because we couldn't take the bees home and do choice experiments in the lab. So we had to do it in the field. Um, but it actually worked surprisingly good. So we did that with actual damaged plants and also with methyl jasmine treated plants. So this is the, the methyl jasmine treated plants. And what you see here, so these, in this case, both inflorescences are open, but here is a, a pair, this is the full control, which has um, the actual test inflorescence that we're looking at, as well as the one that's supposed to be treated, but in the control it's not treated, so this is just a double inflorescence of on undamaged flowers. 
In this particular case, only this inflorescence is on a damaged branch. This is on an undamaged branch, and they are combined. But both of them are down, already suggesting that a volatile emission is probably important. Now, when you cover this one up, then you can only measure pollination here, right? You still have the same effect. So there seems to be no visual cue involved. It's all olfactorial, right? And then just to make that quick, so this is pretty much equivalent to this result. This is exactly this here. So we, because we were wondering where's the volatile emission coming from, so here it's the flowers only in here. Then we put leaves on a damaged plant in here, nothing different. And we also put methyl jasmate only with the flowers because we, you know, methyl jasmate can be smelled by, by bees. So it could be detected by bees. So methyl jasmate could actually here be a problem, but it's not. But it means that the bees orient towards or away from the specifically uh, flower specific and herbivore damage specific orders that are in those flowers here. Okay. <clears throat> Now, um, this entire thing started an entire new large project in my lab that was asking more evolutionary questions. So if the chemistry, the floral chemistry, is so strongly linked to the overall plant metabolism that is also changing in response to herbivory, then there should be a very strong interaction, both ecologically and evolutionary, between the selection by herbivores and by pollinators on chemical traits of the plant, right? And it seems like you have this negative selection, uh, sorry, we have this neg very negative effect of, um, on pollination by herbivores that this is um, kind of an antagonistic interaction evolutionary, we would expect, right? So to um, bring that together, so I'm just um, concluding what, what I just said. So herbivore-induced changes in plant metabolism include vegetative and flora volatile emission. The pollinators use the volatile emission um, to avoid flowers on damaged plants. That comes with a fitness cost for the plant. Um, we don't know how long that fitness cost goes. We can discuss that later. So because this, this, those are perennial plants, and we ob obviously have only a snapshot. So there is, there's a little bit more to that story. But it could have that negative effect. Um, and I didn't talk about the morphological changes. In general, the flowers do not morphologically change, especially to the relatively small amount of damage that we have on the plants. But what changes very consistently is the length of the pistil. And so in tomatoes, and there's this nice work by Steve Tanksley in this building, no, in the other building, it's the other building, right? When he was still here, um, they found that um, the pistil elongation is something that happens at anthesis and is pretty much only the expansion of cells, right, at that stage. And this expansion of the cells is seemingly inhibited um, when you have damage on the plant, which results in the pistol being pulled back or stays back, actually. I don't want to say pulled back. It's not pushed out, um, the, out of the anthocone. So it stays in the anthocone. But this is another kind of question. And this is um, the hypothesis that we derive from that, the correlate, correlated evolutionary process between defensive and reproductive strategy and potentially habitat-specific outcomes of this process. Now, at first, it felt really difficult to approach that from an evolutionary stage, but then there are grad students that are overambitious and advisors like me that allow that overambition. So Stuart Campbell was in my lab, and what he did was he uh, took a total of 56 species of solanaceous plants that were in groups of self-compatible and self-incompatible. So they were different in their mating strategy Right? Self-compatible and self-incompatible. And then he tested all of them for their induced responses to herbivory. So that you have a measure for constitutive resistance when you compare the self-compatible, self-incompatible within each group, and, uh, and also the induced resistance of those. So the idea of that grouping is that we have phylogenetically independent replicates um, or independent comparisons between a self-compatible and a self-incompatible species. And that actually includes, in this particular case, um, 19 independent replicates of the shift from self-incompatible to self-compatible, which we commonly have in plants. Um, but in solanaceous plants, it is even more pronounced. So in all the phylogenies that you see from solanaceous plants, there is no suggestion 
of a reversal of that thing. So it go, always goes phylogenetically from self-incompatible to self-compatible and not reverse, right? Meaning self-compatible is the derived state. But that's important for later on. <clears throat> so what he did to these plants, as I said, within each species, with replication, he had a control that was undamaged, a plant that was mechanically damaged, and a plant that was damaged with manduka. He did all the chemistry for all of those plants, and then also fed the plants back to manduka neonate larvae to measure resistance directly. And this is actually the novel part in this. So we standardize all the resistance to the resistance to manduka. Right? You can discuss whether or not this is good because there may be other species and th things like that. But if you standardize it to the most resistant plant, you can pretty much um, compare resistance across the entire um, phylogeny. Right? And the reason why we did these two treatments was that you then have a measure by comparing these two of the specificity of the induced resistance. Right? Is it specific to Manduka or is it just general? Okay, now how does that look like? If you just look at constitutive production, uh, sorry, of constitutive resistance, and uh, meaning you only compare the controls within each group, and, and here there's, uh, so the self-incompatible are in green, the self-compatible are in blue, and if you blur your eyes, you'd actually see that there is no pattern, seemingly no pattern, um, and it turns out that there is though a slight increase if you can uh, control for phylogeny, so self-incompatible species, in average, have a higher resistance than self-compatible. This is something people had expected, but nobody has really had really looked into it. So self-incompatible, in average, have a higher um, constitutive resistance than self-compatible. This was kind of expected, not necessarily that strong, but it was. Now, if you blur your eyes here, you see that very strong shift of the blue ones to the right and this is reflecting that if you look at inducibility, inducibility, which is the magnitude of change in resistance after the plant was attacked by an herbivore, right? After resistance is induced, then self-compatible species have a much stronger induction than self-incompatible. And this was a big surprise. I had never expected that. So let that sink in a little bit. Self-compatible species, so those who sometimes inbreed, right, may or may not, but sometimes inbreed, are stronger inducible than those that never inbreed. <clears throat> now, if you just look at the resistance at the induced state, right, so you just compare resistance of damaged plants with each other, there's no difference. So that means that self-compatible plants compensate for their disadvantage in constitutive resistance by changing their metabolism in a, in a stronger way. And now I got, get, already gave you a hint, the metabolism, in fact, is changing in a stronger way. Right? So it's only resistance in this picture, but the metabolism is changing. So we were asking, is there some pattern that we can see in the metabolo a secondary metabolite production that could explain that pattern? And sure, we do. And this was a big surprise to me, too. If you just look at this, so these are uh, pairings that are actually in, in those comparisons. So four independent pairings in the petunia genus and the cestrum genus and two in the solanum, but they're two different um, clades within solanum, independent clades. Here are the self-incompatible ones, and here are the self-compatible ones. What is the difference? What do you think? Do you see a difference in general? Just blur your eyes a little bit. Exactly. So there are far more compounds over here. So there's no per se difference in the amounts of compounds. If you just sum up all the compounds, there's no difference. But if you look at the diversity of compounds produced, self-incompatible species have always, almost always more compounds than self-compatible species. Right? Now, interestingly, so this is the picture actually control for phylogeny. It's highly, highly significant. So this is only for phenolic compounds, but you can do that for terpenoids too, and you see pretty much the same picture. <clears throat> so diversity of compound production is higher in self-incompatible species. Um, we think that heterozygosity is affecting diversity of compound production. So within each plant, but also the compounds available within populations. 
And that led to an hypothesis, and that's why I'm, I'm speeding up a little bit, um, that inducibility is generating diverse phenotypes in time. So what does that mean? High diversity, high compound diversity is very strongly correlated with resistance. I will show you a picture in a second. It's, and in fact, after we found that, we went through all of our data, diversity of compound production seems to be the strongest correlate with resistance in comparison in particular to just individual compounds. If you just com you know, correlate individual compounds with the resistance, you never get a strong correlation as the diversity of compounds. That may give self-incompatible species that advantage. So this is the outcrossing advantage they have potentially. And that potentially leads to an increased natural selection. And this is now our hypothesis. We didn't show that here. Um, increased natural selection on self-compatible species for stronger inducibility. Because the stronger inducibility allows the plant to change its phenotype in time, to diversify its phenotype in time. And that gives them the same advantage as the high diversity compound production that um, the other species have, the self incompatible species have. Another thing that's, uh, that's correlated with this is the specificity. Remember I had the mechanical damage and the, the caterpillar damage. If you plot the um, resistance effect on um, caterpillar damaged against those of mechanical damaged plants, if you have a strong correlation there, which we have here in the green line in the self incompatible ones, then you have low um, specificity, right? So the, it's the same response. If that switches and becomes not significant, then you have a higher specificity in the response. And this is true in the self compatible species. So the self compatible ones induce stronger and induce more specifically, right? And then there is this nice considerative induced resistance that was always hypothesized that there is a trade-off in fact so people hypothesize there must be a trade-off between the expression of considerative resistance and inducibility that's true it looks like it right so it's a negative correlation um, and our data actually support that hypothesis in that way but my argument is that trade-off is not necessarily a, a fitness type trade-off it is in fact a reflection of two alternative strategies either having a high diversity of compounds produced and not having to induce resistance or having a very low, because of the mating system they are in, having a low um, compound diversity and therefore being on a strong selection to induce very strongly, to diversify the phenotype in time. So this is the hypothesis that we are now following up um, and do a lot of work on now. And I, I think I have to, to stop here simply. Um, there were only five more slides, but I want to stop here to allow for some more discussion. Um, but in, con in conclusion, what that means, first, we have a very strong correlation between the reproductive and the defensive strategy. So this was the important point of this study. And this is a macroevolutionary um, correlation in this particular case. We also have, um, with work on um, a native Solanum, Solanum carolinense, we showed that there is in fact within a species a similar correlation happening. Um, and so there is something to that. Mating system and resistance are strongly correlated and associated. But what this here is actually providing is in fact a new hypothesis for why inducibility can be important, which is independent of the costs of compound production, entirely independent, right? It provides an alternative strategy for a plant that has to live, or for plant populations that have to live with low compound diversity, right? And with that, I end here and hope we can have some time for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> No, we haven't, only within species. Um, so the Solanum carolinense um, example, there we had different herbivore species, and it is in fact um, differently expressed in different species, right? So with different species, if you will. So if you take, and this is purely because um, 
the response to certain herbivores is stronger than to others to begin with, but also certain herbivores respond more or less to the changes. And this is an important ecological problem, or not, not a problem for us, actually an ecological explanation problem, kind of. Um, because what that means is um, you would have to know what is, so in order to argue there may be natural selection on those traits and on those, in this particular case, on inducibility, right? You have to know what the dominating herbivore in the system is that might actually um, inflict um, fitness costs that are high enough to drive natural selection to begin with, and then that herbivore has to do something to the plant that is, uh, or the plant has to respond to that herbivore in that particular way. We have a number of, of different, which I don't, didn't talk about today, we have a large project on goldenrods here too, and goldenrod has one of the most diverse offerpo communities directly associated with them that I know, so there's a, in this area about 120 herbivore species directly associated with goldenrod, 80% of them are specialists. And in those cases, you find everything. So you find induced susceptibility to one herbivore um, that, for example, so that herbivore is inducing susceptibility to itself. So they do better on the plants that they themselves damaged, but they induce resistance to everybody else, right? Which suggests there might be some manipulation of the inducibility. So it could be a cost of induction. Um, and then there is um, herbivores that induce resistance to themselves so strongly that they have to move away and things like that. So there's any variation of the theme. So they, in the end, it becomes the question, which one of those herbivores is driving the evolution, right? Or is it all of them together, which is still a big question in, in that field anyway. Um, but it's a very good question from that respect. That's a wonderful question. That's a wonderful question. So we did um, a number of studies with um, Ian Kaplan, who is um, now at Duke, um, who, um, for his PhD studies, actually with us, um, analyzed in, uh, in tobacco whether or not induction through the roots and induction through the leaves it changed some effects above and below ground. So there seemed, and there was a, um, a uh, um, meta-analysis associated with one of those papers where we looked into um, are below ground insects affect above ground insects more than the other way around. And it is actually that way. So if you have below ground herbivory, there seem to be stronger metabolic effects above ground and therefore stronger ecological effects. But the other way around is not as strong. Now the question is, and this is still kind of a weird thing in the field, is that simply because we have a harder time measuring below ground, things that go on below ground, or is it a true, uh, a true thing, right? And so at this point, I think a number of people think that there is something fundamentally different between above and below ground. Um, I actually don't think so, um, but we are actually not yet there to say something about it, to make that comparison truly happen. Um, and there is another good example is golden ruts. Um, when we relieve golden ruts from natural selection by herbivores, below ground chemistry goes up through the roof. Um, and in this particular case, it's supposedly an allelopathic compound that we see go up. But that compound is not only allelopathic, it is actually um, a highly cell toxic compound. And a Japanese group looked at it and they kind of wanted to do an kind of, um, um, how do you call it, an ethnobotany kind of approach to goldenrod. Um, and they tested it on, uh, on mammal cell tissue cultures, on uh, nematodes, on bacteria, and it kills everything, right? And, uh, and so the question is, you know, is there simply resources freed? And this is, this is an evolutionary process. So it's natural selection. So it, it's different genotypes that do that in those populations. When you, we, so we, what we did was we uh, repeated that experiment that Dick Root did, a very famous experiment where he had goldenrod populations right out here um, and had plots that he sprayed with insecticide for a number of years and left the other open to ambient herbivory. And they found huge effects on the community. So they were studying the community interaction. So they saw that 
the diversity is dramatically dropping when you take the herbivores out because you benefit the dominating plant species in there, which is Solidago altissima. Um, so what we did was, out of those plots, we took samples and clonally reproduced them, and so that we had um, independent replicates of those. And when you compare them, you see they're completely different genotypes, right? A and that are phenotypes too, right? So different phenotypes that are there. So they have lower resistance when they are in the spray plots, um, even when you have them several years now out of the, out of the plots already. And, uh, and they have this very interesting, traumatic, traumatic increase in allelopathic hormone production. Um, and so there, there is definitely both evolutionary and on an ecological level a very strong interaction that we, and I agree with that, totally underestimate. Um, but it's not time to say whether or not the mechanisms that mediate those interactions are different below and above ground. Right? This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.